Hi everyone, I'm Niels and I'm making simulations of billiards, the wave equations and other models for mathematics and physics. And in the last couple of years I've had quite a few requests that I also make some tutorials on how to realize uh, such simulations. So I've been wanting to do that for quite a while. Now here the time has finally come, so let's see how it goes. So today I want to tell you how you can make this uh, simulation of a mathematical billiard. So, what do I mean by that? Mathematical billiards are quite similar to pool billiards, but there are some important differences. So one of them is that we will assume that there's no friction at all. And another one is that we are going to use more general shapes for the billiard table than just rectangles. So here I've drawn a nice smooth curve. We will see later that it's also possible to have curves with a finite number of corners, uh, but I don't want something complicated like fractal boundaries or uh, self-intersecting curves like figure eights, things like that. So let me assume that I start somewhere in the billiard at some point and I go in some direction and now I have a particle or a way of light moving in a straight line. And so what I want to do is follow this straight line until I hit the boundary, maybe here. And then I make a, a reflection on the boundary. So if this is the normal vector, what I do is that I move in this direction, which is defined by the fact that this angle here is equal to this angle here. Now I keep doing this, so I make another reflection here, let's say that it looks like this, and then another one here, and another one here, and so on and so forth, and I keep doing this as long as, as I like, and the question is what happens, what will the trajectory look like? And the interesting thing is that the behavior depends a lot on the shape of the boundary. It can be very regular, it can be much more chaotic, it can be a mix of both. So now the question is how do we simulate this on a computer? Let me start explaining this by the simplest example in my opinion, which is the billiard in a perfect circle. Actually the circle is so simple that one can compute the whole trajectory even without coordinates, just using Euclidean geometry. But uh, I'm going to, to use a coordinate system because that will be useful for more complicated shapes. So here I have my rectangular Cartesian coordinate system with uh, my two axes. And let's also assume that the circle has radius one. And uh, so this means that, for instance, this point here has coordinates 1, 0, this point here has coordinates 0, 1, and so on. All right, so now what I want to do is that I start with some point inside the circle, x0, y0, and in a direction which I measure by an angle alpha, and I'm going to take the convention which is compatible with trigonometry that the angle is measured from a horizontal line going to the right and moving counterclockwise. So the first thing I want to do is compute the coordinates of the point x1, y1 here. So how do I do that? Well, I want to compute intersections of lines and curves and most lines and curves in the planes can be described either by a Cartesian equation or by a parametric equation. And if I want to compute an intersection, it's usually a good idea to use one type for, for one curve and the other type for the other curve. So what I'm going to do here is to use a, a parametric equation for the the straight line. And this equation is given by the following expression. So x is given by x0 plus cos alpha t. 
and so it's cos alpha times t and y is y naught plus sinus alpha times t. So here uh, t is uh, what we call the parameter. And you can actually interpret it as time. So it means that at time zero, I am at the starting point x naught y naught, and at time t, I'm at this position x t. And I'm simply saying that my velocity vector is cos alpha sine alpha. All right, so now I, I want to compute the intersection of this straight line with the circle, and for the circle I'm going to use a Cartesian equation, and what I'm going to use is the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. So this is just uh, using Pythagoras' theorem to say that the circle is uh, the set of points which are at distance 1 from the center. And now what I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in these expressions from the parametric equation into the Cartesian equation of the circle. So what do I get? Well, I get x naught plus cos alpha times t squared plus y naught plus sinus alpha times t squared equals 1. And the unknown here is t. All the, the other data are given to me. So I have to, to do some algebra to simplify this equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this term here. So I use the formula for a plus b squared. So that is x0 squared plus 2 cos alpha x0 times t plus cos square alpha times t squared. I do something similar for, for the second term here. And as I want to solve for t, it's a good idea to factor this with powers of t. So I will have a term cos square alpha plus sin square alpha times t squared plus and then I have uh, the mixed terms, so that I can write as 2 times uh, x naught cos alpha plus y naught sin alpha times t. And it's times t like this. And I have a term which does not depend on t, which will be x naught square plus y naught square minus 1, and this should be equal to 0. <coughs> okay, so you already see a simplification because this term is equal to 1. And uh, the others, let me call them just b and c. So you see what I actually have here is uh, the equation t square plus 2bt plus c equals 0. Now, this is uh, an equation of, of degree 2, and there's a formula to solve it, but actually uh, I can do something, uh, even if I don't remember the, the formula, I can do the following. I can say that this is just t plus b squared. Okay, so if I expand that, I get also b squared term, which I have to subtract, so minus b squared plus c equals 0. Or in other words, t plus b squared is equal to b squared minus c. Okay, so uh, now you may say that uh, I want to take the square root, but do I know that the right-hand side is actually positive? Well, yes, it is, because uh, the c here is actually negative if I start inside the circle, or it may perhaps be zero if I start on the boundary of the circle. 
So uh, I can take the square root and I get that t plus b is equal to plus minus square root of b square minus c. Or in other words, t is equal to minus b plus minus square root b square minus c. So which is just the formula for the solution of this second order equation. Now, uh, I have still the plus minus here. Uh, which one do I have to take? Well, that's actually easy because I want to move in the positive time direction. So I'm only interested in the plus solution here. So I will take the plus solution here. So that gives me the value of t. And then I just plug it into this equation. And for that particular value of t, I get my point x1, y1. All right, so I'm already halfway there. Now uh, I still need to compute the, the angle after the reflection. So let's do it like this. So first of all, I let's recall that here I have my angle alpha, which will also be here. And now uh, I can also compute the angle here. Let me call it phi, which I find here. So how do I get phi? Well, I already know x1 and y1. So, and I can write them as cos phi sinus phi. So this you have to use very, very often in this kind of problem. So let's just declare that the solution of that is that phi is the argument of x1, y1. And in some uh, languages, there is already a function doing that. But if not, you can actually easily construct this by using uh, uh, the arctangent. So you see that actually the tangent of phi is equal to uh, y1 over x1. Then you just have to be a bit careful with the sign of x1. So uh, the case x1 equals 0 is, uh, is a particular case that gives you pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. And the case x1 negative uh, will require you to add pi to the, to the arctangent. All right, but now we have our angle phi. And then uh, what we just do is that we make, uh, so let me just draw the, the reflected trajectory here. So what I say is that I have here the angle alpha minus phi, which I also have here. And what I'm interested in is the new angle here. Let me call it alpha 1. And well, you see that alpha 1 can be written as phi plus pi and minus uh, alpha minus phi. So this is the same as 2 phi minus alpha plus pi. All right, so now I have uh, also the, the new angle. And now I can just start over. So I start with this new point x1, y1. I go in the direction alpha 1, and I can compute the coordinates of my point x2, y2, and so on and so forth. Now, OK, maybe you don't like this uh, working with, uh, with angles like that. There's another way, uh, which is to say uh, if I take my, my vector v, so v will be the vector cos alpha, sinus alpha. It's my velocity vector. 
and I also have a vector n here. So n, that will be the normal vector, which is cos phi sinus phi. And I want to compute the vector v prime here. So there's a formula saying that v prime is the same as v minus 2 v inner product n times n. And that allows you to get this formula here. There's only one drawback. Uh, if you want to code this and you want it to be fast, it's not a good idea to use lots of trigonometric functions. So every time you compute a cos or a sine, it takes some time. So if you compute v prime like that, then you have to transform it to uh, you know the same formula as here. All right, but now we have uh, solved the, the problem of computing the trajectory in a circular billiard. Now let's look at some other examples. So here I have the billiard in an ellipse. So again, I have my coordinate system and I have to decide what is the size of my ellipse. So an ellipse is defined by a semi-minor axis uh, and a semi-major axis. So let me call these A and B. But actually, remember, I took a radius of 1 for my circle. So actually, this b I can take equal to 1. And a, I, OK, my habit is to call this parameter lambda. So now, uh, well, we can start exactly as before. So here, I have my point x0, y0. I have my direction alpha, and I want here to compute x1, y1. So the parametric equation for uh, the straight line is exactly the same as before. What changes is the equation of my ellipse here. So the equation now, so if I call the semi-axis lambda and 1, the equation is given by x squared over lambda squared plus y squared, y squared over 1, is equal to 1. So if I take the parametric equation of my straight line, plug it into this equation, I get, again, a second-order equation for t. And this allows me, after solving it, taking the right solution to give my, uh, to find my x1 and y1. Now, uh, I still need now to compute the, the new angle. So how do I do that? Now I can't just use, as before, the, so my, my arc function to, to get the angle. So what I need is the, either the normal vector here at x1, y1, or the tangent vector. And that can be done, for instance, by using the parametric equation of my ellipse. So this parametric equation can be written as x is equal to lambda cos, let's say, s, and y is equal to sinus s. So that is x of s, y of s, and now I take the derivative, so x prime of s, is equal to minus lambda sinus s and y prime of s is cosine of s. And that gives me a, a tangent vector here. So this uh, t tangent vector has coordinates minus lambda sinus s and cosine s which I can also express directly in terms of x1 and y1. Now, uh, another way of doing it, I also can compute the normal vector n here. And the normal vector I get by taking the gradient of this equation here. So if I take the gradient, 
it means that I take the x and the y derivatives and the two components, so the x derivative is 2x over lambda squared, and the y derivative is 2y, and that will give me my normal vector. And so once I have either the tangent or the normal vector, I can just uh, proceed as before, so I, I can compute all the angles I need to compute my reflected trajectory. So that's it for the ellipse. Now let's look at still another case, which is the rectangle. So for the rectangle, again, I have to choose uh, its dimensions. So let's say that, again, the width is 2 lambda, the height is 2, for instance. And now I'm facing actually two problems. One of them is related to the fact that I don't have such a nice parametric equation for the boundary. But that is actually not uh, really a problem. I can just give a piecewise uh, parametrization of the boundary. So if s is my parameter along the boundary, I start here with s equals zero, and then s will just be the length along the boundary. So at this corner, I arrive at s is equal to uh, 2 lambda. And then here uh, I add 2, so s is 2 lambda plus 2. And then I have here uh, s is uh, 4 lambda plus 2. And finally here I arrive at s is 4 lambda plus 4. And each piece now of the boundary has a parametric equation. So for the, for the bottom side here, it will be x is uh, minus lambda plus s, y is minus 1. For the right hand side, I will have x is lambda and y, so what's y? So y is uh, minus 1 plus s minus 2 lambda. And so on for the, the other two sides. Now I can proceed as before. So I start here with the, my initial point, x0, y0. So Okay, here with my convention, the angle alpha will be like that. So I want to compute x1, y1. So I have, again, my parametric equation. So x is x0 plus cos alpha times t. y is y0 plus sinus alpha times t. And I want to look at the intersection with this side uh, here, which is given by uh, y is equal to minus 1. And I have a condition on x, so minus lambda smaller x smaller lambda. Or perhaps I want to say smaller equal. So we'll see about that. But now you see that since y uh, should be equal to minus 1, this immediately gives me uh, the value of t, right? So I have uh, y0 plus sinus alpha times t equal minus 1. So it means that t should be equal to minus 1 minus y0 over sinus alpha. And once I have t, I have the coordinate x, I have my x1, and I can check this condition here. And I can do the same for the other sides of the rectangle, and I have to see which is actually the side I'm going to intersect. Now there, there's a second difficulty which is related to the behavior of the corner. So that one is a little bit more tricky. So what happens 
already for the mathematical model if I hit the corner directly. Well, one way of looking at this is to say that I start a little bit to the left of the corner and then I realize that I will be reflected like this and, and like this. So you see that the trajectory makes kind of a U-turn. And if I do it the other way around, maybe I do this and then I do this and then I do this. So I make a U-turn again. So I was going this way and I was going this way. So if I enter my corner, so I hit the corner in this direction, the the right rule would be that I just move backwards. Another way of seeing this is to do what we call an unfolding, so I can continue here my rectangle and look at this trajectory, continue this like here, and then I just, you know, this bit I reflect up here, take a reflection here, and this bit here I reflect twice to get here. And if I do the same for the trajectory that is hitting the corner, well, I, I see that by making two reflections I should really make a U-turn. Now, there's a thing you have to be a bit careful with when you, when you code this, because as we've seen before, if the trajectory is like this, and I said I wasn't sure if I had to take x smaller equal lambda or strictly smaller lambda. So if I take x smaller equal lambda, what will happen is that I consider that I hit the bottom side here, and then I will be reflected outside the, the billiard like that. And on, on the other hand, if I do this and I consider that I hit the right side first, I will be reflected like this. So in both cases, my code will produce something uh, wrong. And there are two ways of dealing with this. So one way is actually to really carefully describe what happens when you hit a corner. And really, uh, now you have eight cases, depending on whether you had hit one of the four si sides or one of the four corners. And this is actually what I did when I, I coded for the first time this uh, billiard and rectangle. But I made a mistake somewhere, and if you look at one of my, of my first simulations uh, of particles in a square, there's actually at the very end of the simulation, there's a particle somewhere that leaves uh, the square. The other way of dealing with the problem is to just ignore it in the sense that if you make simulations with lots and lots of particles, it's quite unlikely that they hit the angle directly. And uh, what you can do then, what I did for more complicated shapes, is just to add a test that tells me if a particle is inside the domain or not. And if it's outside, I just consider that it's not active anymore and, I, and then I don't draw it anymore. So if there are many particles, you will lose a few of them, but it won't be such uh, so noticeable in the simulation. There's yet another way of dealing with it. In some of these uh, illumination problem simulations, you actually assume that when you hit a corner, then your particle is just uh, absorbed by the corner and it doesn't exist anymore. All right, so we've seen a few examples here. Now, uh, I, con after doing these first simulations of uh, circles and squares and so on, I did quite a few other shapes like the triangle here, uh, the stadium billiard, which is uh, this one here, with uh, two half circles and, uh, and uh, two straight lines. Billiards like Sinai billiards, uh, like the Analus here, or some star-shaped billiards here. One thing you can notice about all these shapes is that the boundaries are always made of straight line segments or circular arcs or 
in at least one case uh, an ellipse. And the reason I don't use more complicated shapes is that for these I'm sure that I can always solve the equation for my parameter t explicitly, there's a formula. While if I take more complicated shapes, uh, maybe curves which uh, involve some trigonometric functions and so on, it may be that I have to so solve approximately the equation and then you can do it, but it takes more time and you make more uh, round of errors if you solve numerically the intersection problem. Now I think the most complicated shape I, I coded like this is, uh, is this one, which is actually Penrose or one of Penrose's solutions of the illumination problem. It's made of several arcs of ellipses and several straight line segments and <clears throat> I think it took me at least half a day to code it and another half day to debug it. So the thing is with such a complicated shape what can happen is that you make mistakes somewhere in how you encode positions on the boundary and then I sometimes got uh, situations where particles would maybe leave here the uh, the billiard here and, and then they would appear magically at another place because of, of this mistake. So of course this can be corrected but it takes some time. But then I went on doing more complicated shapes like uh, you know Sinai billiards with the circular scatterers or here we have a, a, an approximation of a fractal shape so it's not really a fractal it's a level I guess five or six approximation of a von Koch snowflake or uh, complicated polygons like here for the Tokarski billiard or mazes and I soon realized that it was not practical to rewrite the whole code that computes intersections and angles and so on for each new shape so uh, I started doing things in a slightly more systematic way so how does it go? Well, let's assume that my billiard is made of lots and lots of circles like this. And like for these Sinai type billiards. And let's again assume that I start at some point uh, here. And I go in some direction like this. So the, the way I coded this is to first define a general type of billiard called circles. And for circles I have several options saying where the centers of the circles are placed and what, what are their radii. And then I wrote a generic function that just said for whatever arrangement of circles I have I uh, now do the same as before. So I start with a, with a point and, and the direction. I look at the straight line and the straight line will hit some circles. It won't hit others. So for each circle it hits, I uh, compute the intersection points and I, I get time parameters like T1, T2 and so on. And then I just have to find the smallest value of time, which will be the first intersection, which here will be that one. And then I, I do my reflection. So maybe I go here and I go here and so on. Okay, one just has to be careful when after a reflection, uh, one starts on the boundary not to count the starting point as an inter intersection. So you usually have to put a little bit of margin say you take the first time larger than 10 to the minus 10 or something like that to find the next intersection. And the same can be done for polygons or for mixes of polygons, arcs of circles. So for instance I used this approach to code circular mazes which are made by line segments and circular arcs. 
Now, people who uh, know about object-oriented programming uh, probably see that it's even possible to make things more abstract, more general by you know, introducing different objects, which can be circles, or segments, arcs of circles, arcs of ellipses, and other shapes, and maybe code this in an even more uh, transparent way. Okay, so the last thing I want to, to say is how do we get from these computations of trajectories to making animations? So a first remark is that since the particles in my billiard are not interacting, if I can compute the trajectory of one particle, I can compute the trajectory of any number of particles. So that's not a problem. So there's one more thing uh, one has to realize to avoid making too many computations. So, okay, let's look again at a situation like this where I start at some point and I have already uh, computed the first intersection. So let's say my starting point here is x naught y naught is before. So I have already computed x1 y1 and I already gave here the starting angle alpha, alpha naught maybe, and I have also computed the next angle here, which will be alpha one. So alpha one will be this angle here. Right here. Now, uh, when I want to make an animation, the basic principle hasn't changed uh, since the invention of, of the cinema. I just make lots and lots of uh, still frames where I just increase time a little bit between each frame. So what I'm going to do is that I start with my particle here. I have computed all these data, x1, y1, and so on. And then I just move my particle ju just a little distance by small increments for each frame a little bit more along this line. But I don't have to compute the next intersection point every time. I have already computed it. So the only thing I do is that when computing x1, x, y1, I can also compute the length here. And now uh, I have here uh, my distance, which increases at every time step. So at every time step, d will be mapped to d plus some, uh, some, some delta d. And then I keep doing this as long as d is smaller than l, or smaller equal l. So uh, as long as this condition is satisfied, I keep adding small increments. And if d is larger than l, so I have these two cases, if d is larger than l, then it means that I have to wrap around my my position so then I actually compute the next intersection point which is somewhere here so that would be x2 y2 so I now have the next straight line segment here something like that and uh, okay I can also already compute the next direction and then I just keep doing the same so I just add small increments to the position along this line segment until I have reached the length of this new line. All right, so now uh, you know everything you need to know to make your own billiard simulations. So uh, I hope this was uh, useful to you. So feel free to comment and I may do other tutorials like that. So. If you have suggestions, things you would like me to talk about, let me know and see you next time.